Good morning. We have another group of pilgrims outside celebrating Mass, and this group more like Pentecostal inside, having, and both wanting to see the sunrise. So this morning they will have the sunrise in their hearts. Because we have another blessing coming. It looks like rain, but I'm not sure if they will. I felt a couple of drops this morning, and that's the blessing of the new year. Some people say, how is it possible that every time there is a new year, there's rain here? How can they arrange that for the feast? But actually the feasts were originated on the agricultural basis, the meteorological basis, the calendar is done by the moon, and so the seasons change. They will finish in about 10 minutes. So the seasons change, and this is a natural uh, turn in the year, and the climate is, the weather is changing. Somebody wanted to be praying in there, so I just told them that the group will be will be finished inside in another 10 minutes or so because they're leaving today and they need to go and have breakfast and get ready and leave the life of the pilgrims, you know. So it's normal then after uh, the summer weather that a transition happens in toward winter. And this is part of, of nature, part of the cycles of the year. So then there's always this atmospheric change. Today we have precious readings of the joy of the of God's people listening to his word. And it's interesting we see the people coming back from Babylon and now they have some structure, they have a governor, they have a probably like a high priest, Ezra and Nehemiah, the governor, and they're celebrating one of the big um, moments of this whole return. It wasn't just a physical return, but it was a rediscovery of God's word. And when they were uh, rebuilding the temple, repairing the walls, they had a discovery of, of the text, and they celebrated that. And that's the reason why also the people came out of Egypt, not just back from the exile, but they came to receive God's word, to worship God. That's the, actually the primary purpose of life and will be the dominant purpose of eternity. And it will be filled with joy and praise and goodness. I even saw a jet ski out there about 20 minutes ago. But far away, it wasn't audible over on the other side. The primary purpose of life is to discover God. It's not ice cream, it's not Coca-Cola, it's not driving a car, it's not doing a good live stream, it's not making a cake. And all those things can become part of that primary purpose in the measure that <clears throat> they are connected in that worship of God. And that's the great quest of the religious and spiritual life is to lift up Sorry about the sun this morning. You got some nice equipment there. Yeah, I'm doing live stream, so I just get your camera in there. 
I didn't show your face yet because I didn't have your consent, so. Where are you from? Mexico. Mexico, oh, okay. Do you publish pictures? Uh, from, from my son, uh, Ah, okay. Yeah. So to ponder that the primary purpose of life is to worship God. There are marvelous books about that, that we were also reading in the Novitiate 48, 49 years ago, that our whole life is forgotten. In fact, when we were little children, we learned that. Why did God create us? To know him and love him and worship him with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's the purpose of life. It's not to make money. It's not to build a castle. It's not to become important, to become well known, to indulge in pleasures. And all those things are given as well uh, in our lives and they have their, their purpose and their place. But then there's also a very big challenge for religious people who develop this, this side of awareness of their lives and their prayer life and they neglect kindness and charity. Because one of the most important criteria for worshipping God is to love and serve each human being made in his image and likeness. Because how could you say you love America or any other country and burn their flag? Step on their flag, throw it out. No, you, you, the image and likeness of God that is every human being is a direct, tangible presence of God. Even more powerful than a sunrise, even more powerful than a beautiful, animal life, deer chasing along the mountain, fish jumping in the water, the human being. And so this is the great, the great uh, synthesis then that Jesus offered the disciples here when they asked what was the greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And how can you bring worship to the Lord without, if you have something, if your neighbor has something against you, leave your offering at the altar and go first and reconcile with your, with your neighbor, with your brother, with your sister, with your parents. That great um, integration and harmony of love of God and love of neighbor. I think they're in a moment of quiet, thankful gratitude for the Eucharist before the blessing. They've been out here since about six. And then a whole other dimension develops more powerfully the love of neighbor. In today's gospel, Jesus sending out his disciples to spread the good news and he's given them very concrete instructions. And that love of neighbor becomes a dimension then of bringing them good news. Sometimes there's sadness and discouragement, there's grief and death, there's pain and sorrow and illness. And to bring good news, to bring a culture of love into the world. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. That's where we have fulfillment and peace. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. There we have.
have that. I think it's a purple heron actually, oops. You should have seen these birds here, this contingent, the squadron of these new invader birds that are here for the last few years. I think we leave it like that for today, people. Wishing you many blessings and be filled with the peace of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. Precepts of the law give joy to the heart. God bless you.